Hey everybody, welcome. Um, lecture 8.7, the last lecture in the memory chapter. And I'm going to go to here for a second just to say, okay, episodic memory and why it can't always be trusted. So we're really going to focus in on conscious memory uh, for this part of the, of the lecture, of this part of the chapter, I guess. Um, but I want to give you a sense of how what is conscious memory and most importantly what is it not so i'm going to flip these words here and what i'm going to ask you to do is just memorize these words look at them try your best to memorize them um we're, i'm going to test your memory in a certain way for them in a little bit but for now just take a look and try your best to memorize them uh, don't take a picture don't write things down i mean you can but if you do don't look at it after uh, until until the demo is done. Just giving you time. You can pause if you want more time. Okay, so now I'm going to go forward. But again, if you want to pause and look at these words a little longer, go ahead. Okay, I am going to just jump back in uh, to lectures. Now, this may look familiar to you. <laughs> Maybe you even remember where we did it. Um, let me throw a bit more on here. Remember when we were talking about perception and we were talking about how your brain um, forms a representation of what's coming at it, but it's got a ton of stuff coming at it, right? All sorts of sights and sounds and all these kinds of things. And the brain is trying to make sense of it. Um, and, and it does so by sort of taking parts of the input, but also using things it's seen before, you know, knowledge of the world that it's acquired. And it tends to want to sort of view the new stuff coming in as stuff it's seen before, right? So it uses information about what it knows about the world to kind of decode what it's seeing right now. And so we did a bunch of examples. So this one, for example, uh, again, I don't know how powerful this one is for you guys, but when I ask, you know, who is this? This is a TV character named Judge Judy. Uh, if you had watched the Judge Judy show, if you knew Judge Judy, it would be very easy for you to see her uh, in this mess of stuff. Your previous experience, having seen her, and especially seen her in this sort of situation, because this is often how the TV show was filmed, uh, would help you to make sense of this noisy input, right? We also did examples like this one, where we said, okay, we actually tend to see a triangle here. We tend to see three circles and two triangles. But even though this top triangle doesn't really exist at all, it's really just three Pac-Men and three greater than or less than signs. But we see this top triangle. Why? Because in the world, we tend to see circles and triangles. We don't tend to see Pac-Men and greater than signs. And so the brain ends up perceiving this in a way that's more consistent with things that it's seen. So when we say perceiving it now, we can connect some dots to, and we can kind of say what's represented in working memory, because that is the sort of conscious mind, right? So what gets into working memory from the outside world is something that's partly based on the input, but also based on an analysis of that input through top-down processes that makes us see it in a certain way, a way that's consistent with the past, a way that makes sense, okay? So, this is how working memory deals with uncertainty. And, you know, we've talked about how extreme it will go. It will assume information or ignore information or reorder information. It will do what it needs to do to make that partial information make sense. And by making sense, we mean it kind of fits with things we've seen before, things we've experienced before. Okay, what's that, by the way? That's long-term memory. Right? So long-term memory is helping making sense of our perceptual input. Okay, that was the story with perception. And what I want to tell you now is it's the same story when it comes to conscious memory. Really, the only thing that will change is where that information is coming from. Is it coming from the real world? Then we're talking about perception. Is it coming from long-term memory? Then we're talking about conscious memory and how conscious memories are re-experienced, okay? And that's what we're going to do. We're going to move to conscious memory here. So 
let me um, if we if we kind of think of it in these terms because we've been using this model a lot in the perception situation we're talking about this right this is where the information is coming from the exterior world we're seeing it not not as complete remember people might be behind cars there could be occluded stuff there could be all this partial information but when it gets to short term memory or working memory it uses information from long term memory to help make sense of that input um, and to, to perceive it as something that makes sense. What we're now going to focus on is this part. Yes, you can bring information from the real world into your conscious mind, but you can also bring information from your past into your conscious mind. And we call that retrieval. And the critical point is it's the same thing with retrieval, that what we're going to get in our conscious mind is not an exact copy of what's in long-term memory, but rather long-term memory will store some of the details, we'll bring those in, and then we'll make sense of it. And you're going to see this play out in a couple of situations. So let's start by jumping back to your memory test. Okay, so let me begin by first just sort of informing you one of the ways we test memory. And that's through something called an old new recognition test. That is, we'll present a series of, series of words like this, for example, and we'll ask the question for each word, was it on the list? You say old if it was. Yes, it's a word from that list. You say new if it was not, if it's a new word, right? Old means it was on the list. New means it was not. Uh, and so we're going to do this. We're just going to do it with four. So here's four items. And here's specifically what I want you to do for each of these items. For each of these items, I want you to write a number between one and seven. And that number is going to simultaneously capture whether you think it was on the list or not, but also how confident you are. Okay. And what I mean by that is let's start with a watch. Was watch on the list? If you're very confident it was not, then you give it a one. If you're very confident it was, then you give it a seven. But of course, you can also use a three if you think it was not or a five if you think it was. So use that whole continuum from one to seven to capture both whether you think it was on the list and how confident you are. And so let's do these for these four words. Watch. What do you think? Was it on the list? How confident? Write down a number. Then do the same for candle. Then do the same for bed. Then do the same for needle. I'll give you a second. Okay, so I'm going to go back to that list in a second, but I'm just going to walk through these. I know what was on the list and what wasn't. So I'm going to tell you that, uh, and then you can believe me or not, <laughs> and then we'll go back and confirm. So the first one was watch on the list. So I will tell you right now, no, it was not. And I think most of you guys probably got that. So most of you guys probably have a one or two or three for watch. Um, you know it was not on the list. A few of you may have may have done a false alarm. Some of you might think it was on the list, uh, but not many of you. And you're probably not very confident it was if you did. What about candle? Candle was on the list, right? And again, I suspect most of you guys will will have got got that. So five, six, or seven. Um, thinking, yeah, it was on the list. And that gives you an idea of how confident you are for an item that was on the list, right? And you get that sense. What about bed? And what about needle? I'm going to tell you that both of these were not, are not on that list. But I suspect for most of you, for at least one of those words, you not only said, yes, it was on the list, but you said it with a high level of confidence. It's like, darn right, that was on the list. I'm sure it was on the list. And yet here I am telling you it was not. With these kinds of words, and I'll tell you what these kinds of words are in a moment, um, but about 40% of people experience what we call a false memory. They think it was on the list and they're very confident that it was on the list. When I do this demo with judges from the National Judicial Institute, it's the, that number holds up. About 40% of them experience this false memory, and it freaks them out, by the way. What do you mean it wasn't on the list? 
I'm sure it was on the list. This is probably how you feel right now. Okay. Watch candle bed needle. Let's go all the way back to the list. So watch, no. Candle, yes. Bed or needle, no. It's just not there. What the heck? How can you consciously remember something that never occurred? We call this a false memory. Um, and there's this whole notion of false memory syndrome. You, We now know how to create false memories. That's what we just did to you. How do we do that? Well, we take some central word that we want to create a false memory for, like bed. And then we ask another group of people, what's the first word that comes to mind when I say the word bed? And they say things like sleep, pillow, dream, mattress, sheet, night, tired, blanket. These are what we call primary associates. They're the first words that come to mind. So we didn't show bed, but we showed a bunch of words that are very related to bed. And similarly, we didn't show needle, but we showed tetanus, Ugh. tetanus, ditches, thimble, cactus, mm, shot, thread, pierce. Those are all related to needle. And so when I put up bed, what does your brain do? It does not retrieve a copy of this. Our memories are not photographs and videos. We do not have perfect recreations, recreations of some past event. What the brain does is it stores a little bit of details about it. And then when we are in a memory situation, we see bed, we think, what well, was bed on the, on the list? Yeah, I think it was. It feels like it should have been on the list, and it kind of was, right? It wasn't in reality, but there are all these things related to bed. So that notion, yeah, that would fit. That would make sense that bed was on the list, and it would make sense that needle was on the list. Um, in fact, probably more than candle. If we go back to here, because candle was only there once, but there was a bunch of stuff related to needle and bed. And so what you might have found is with candle, which was on the list, you might have said, yeah, and you might have given it a five or six. I'm pretty sure it was on the list. But with bed or needle, you might have given it a higher confidence, even more confident of something that was not on the list. And that's because it was related to so many things that were on the list. And so it fit, right? It really fit that list. It would have made a lot of sense for it to be on there. And that's what the brain seems to use. And so we end up being strongly convinced of something that never occurred. Freaky, huh? Let me give you a little bit of the background of this so you understand it a little bit better. And a lot of that background is connected to a gentleman named Sir Frederick Bartlett. Um, he's the one that's, that first told, suggested that memory is what he called reconstructive. You don't retrieve memories, even though we use that term, you reconstruct them. And so he said, people remember the gist of things, not the details. And if pushed to remember, they will normalize. Let me explain what this means. So he started with something in, in his experiments called War of the Ghosts. It was a Native American tale um, about these two individuals that get picked up in a canoe and they become part of this sort of war. Uh, and then they go back to their, their campfire area and one of them dies. Okay. Um, but the tale is told in a very Native American way. And it makes reference to things like Native American spirituality and, and Native American sort of traditions and habits of, of the day. What Frederick Bartlett did is he rode around on his bicycle. He's a British guy going, going to work. And for his first experiment, he would stop certain people he got to know. And he would say, I want to read you a story. And I'm going to read you the story today. But then I'm going to stop you every now and then afterwards. And I'm going to ask you to tell me the story back. And that's exactly what he did. And what he found is when they told him the story back, again, they had the basic storyline right? The basic events were there, but they normalized. So what do we mean by normalized? Well, instead of making reference to Native American spirituality, 
they made reference to the more British, the, the Catholic and the Anglican and, and those sorts of spiritualities, the spirituality they knew, the Christian spirituality. So they brought that in, in, in place. And in terms of the sort of things that these people were doing, rather than the Native American sort of habits and, and traditions, they brought in British sort of behaviors. And so basically, they remembered the story in a way that had the critical parts of the story, but, was, but, but, but as told in a sort of British context, which was their normal context, right? And so they brought the story into their world and told it the way a British person would tell a story. They've normalized it, and it's only normal in the sense of their own perspective, right? So they've made it more, tr more consistent with their cultural way of doing things. Interesting. Um, here's another experiment he did that I think even kind of gives a better sense of it. He started with this picture and he asked people, uh, so the first person, he had a bunch of people and the first person he said, take a look at this picture and please turn it over, let a few minutes pass and now draw the picture. And the person drew this. Okay, cool. Now we showed that to the next person. Look at it for a while, flip it over, draw the picture. The next person drew this. And the next person drew this, and the next person drew this. On, we're down the line. And what you see across these people is somehow this owl, which to me looks a whole lot like the OVO owl. <laughs> Coincidence? I don't know. Um, but anyway, we start with this owl, but it becomes a cat. How did that happen? Well, each time when somebody was like, if I saw this one and I had to draw, I couldn't remember all the details. I remember some of the details. There's quite a few of the details he's got here. But he's already, for example, added bigger ears that then stick and probably become part of the cat issue. And similarly, this part, which is still clearly a wing, at some point, people are kind of messing it up and it sort of turns into a tail um, at some level. So with each recounting or with each redrawing, they're getting some of the details right but then they're not just getting other stuff wrong, but they're almost embellishing, right? They're adding a little. They're making it make sense. Like if you saw this, what the heck was that? Um, and so that person kind of added a tail to it and made it more kitty-like. Um, and that's where the owl started to turn into the cat uh, more here. And so what Bartlett is saying is this is how your memory works. Each time you remember, you don't load in a picture of that past experience, but rather you remember some of the details and then you recreate a memory around that. With every new telling, you're recreating the memory. And as a result, that memory is changing. It's, it's being affected by each retelling, but you don't think it is because you can't tell the difference between the data you actually retrieved and the data that you added to make it make sense. To you, every time you recount the memory, it feels like you've done so accurately, even though a lot of parts of it are inaccurate. Kind of freaky. So we have this split between whether we're accurate or not and how confident we are. Th Let me give you a couple of other examples to show you how this has played out. So this first one is from Elizabeth Loftus. Elizabeth Loftus is the expert when it comes to applying memory research in the legal context. Uh, and one of her studies is kind of cool. It, it went like this. So people first saw a car, a video of a car um, that runs into another car. Okay. And they're shown other things too. But at some point they're then asked about that. Remember the video about the cars? Well, I would like you to tell me how fast the first car was going when it smashed into the second car. That was one of the group. But other people, she said, how fast was the first car going when it collided? with the second car. Another group bumped into the second car. Fourth group, how fast was the first one going when it hit the second car? And the final group, how fast was car one going when it contacted that other car? Okay, what she found is that the estimates that people gave tracked the extremeness of the verb. So if the verb was extreme like smashed, they tended to do a very high estimate. But if it was much more mild, like contact, they tended to do a lower estimate. And she, what she suggested is that people actually remember it differently. When you ask using the extreme verb, 
they retrieve an extreme memory. So the question and the wording of the question affects the memory that people retrieve. Well, some people said, are you sure it affects the memory? Maybe they're just giving you a high number for some other reason. And she said, well, okay, so I also did the following. After I asked them how fast it was going, I asked them if there was smashed glass at the scene. There was not. Okay, in the, in the original one, there was no smashed glass. But here's what happened, and we'll just look at uh, a few of these conditions. So here's a control condition uh, where we didn't ask them this first question at all. We just asked them, was there smash class? And six people said there was, okay? And 44 said there wasn't, and there wasn't. So these six people are just wrong. Um, but that's okay. That gives us our chance notion. And what she showed is, okay, when you use hit, when car one hit, car two, that doesn't really change things. But when you use smashed, now suddenly 16 people tell you there was smashed glass. And so that suggests that when they're retrieving that episode, when they're replaying that episode in their mind, they're actually seeing it as more dramatic, as though the car hit harder and as though there was smashed glass at the scene. The way you ask the question matters. You know from legal context, you've probably heard this now, um, you know, um, what do they say? Objection, Your Honor, the lawyer is trying to lead the witness. They're asking the question in a way that's trying to lead the witness to give them the answer they want. So if we wanted to paint a picture of a dramatic crash, we would use words like smashed when we ask people about it. But now the legal system, thanks to, thanks to Liz Loftus, is on to that, um, and they don't allow people to use this as a way. Okay, let me give you this example, which is even more dramatic. All right, so here's the story. The story goes as follows. There was a woman, a home alone, doing housework with the television on. At some point, an assailant breaks into her home and attacks her and rapes her. Um, she calls the police. The police come and they say, did you get a look at the assailant? And she says, oh, yeah. And they're like, okay, cool, cool. Um, can we get a, a sketch artist in that can you can work with them and you can get a sketch of the assailant? She said, sure. And she did that. And they produced a very good sketch. Uh, in fact, so good, they were very easily able to connect it with this gentleman, um, Donald Thompson, who, by the way, happens to be a psychologist and a memory expert. Uh, and so they go to Donald and they, and they say, hey, buddy, we have a witness that has you on the scene and you're in a lot of trouble. And Thompson says, when was this? And they tell him and he said, oh, I was on a live TV. I was being interviewed on live TV then. So I have an airtight alibi. I, I couldn't. I wasn't in the apartment. I couldn't have done it. Yes and no. So yes, he was not in the apartment. He did not do it. But was he in the apartment? Her television, it turns out, was tuned to the channel that Don Thompson was on. So what did her brain do? Well, you know, imagine you've, you've been through this traumatic thing. You, you want justice, right? You want that person caught. Uh, and so you want to remember their face. And so what the brain has done, what her brain has done is taken that face that she saw on television and sort of transplanted it onto the assailant. That's who she remembered. She wasn't lying. She wasn't, you know, trying to, to get Don Thompson in trouble. She didn't even know who Donald Thompson was beyond him being on TV. That's who she remembered. Her brain to make sense of that event and to give her the information that she wants to get justice, her brain combined his face with the assailant's body and that became who she remembers. So she remembers him as the rapist, even though he was not. That's dramatic. That's the brain recreating a memory as best it can with the data it has in a way that tries to make sense. Okay, so it's the same story. It's the same story as the perceptual input where, you know, you have noisy data and the brain makes sense of it, but this time the data is coming from your memory. And we do not store complete full episodes of previous experiences. We store a bit of data and then our memory rebuilds the experience each time. But the thing is, we, to us, every time we rebuild it, it feels right as it is. We can't detect that some of those parts of the information were added or changed 
etc. It just feels like how we remember it. And in fact, sometimes we can feel really confident and be really wrong. Pretty freaky. <laughs> I'm going to leave it there. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye.